don't know about you, but that doesn't always jump out as much as some of those other things because I'm so focused on the church and how, how amazing it must have been. But, but I started reading this, this filled with awe. And, and let me ask you, what are you in awe of? Think of when that word comes to mind. Well, what am I just in awe of? Because I, I don't know about you, but I think this word awesome gets thrown around a little too flippantly. You know, we start saying, man, man, I saw this awesome thing. You know, I saw at the game. There was an awesome play at the game. You think that's awesome? Or we see some new car. You know, we, we're down, going down the street, we see the latest, greatest car. And maybe we say, man, that is awesome. Maybe it's a new song that comes out, a new outfit, new dance, maybe a new hairdo. Is that awesome? I don't know. I, I think this word awe, I think it gets diluted a little bit because we just throw it around to describe a sports play. Or we throw it around to describe something like this. And so sometimes I think when we, we're going to back that up there. Sometimes I think when we, we see those things in the Bible, we see everyone was filled with awe. It doesn't have the same punch. Because we're looking at a sports play saying that was awesome. I looked up the literal translation, and Young's literal translation. If you ever want to just reference some stuff, go to Young's literal translation. There's some great stuff in there. And, and this literal translation of this says, And fear came on every soul. I don't know about you, when I see a great play in a game, it doesn't cause fear to come on my soul. When I see a cool car or new dance, I don't have fear upon my soul. But literally, what this translates to is, and fear came upon every soul. Now that's awesome. That's awesome. I want fear upon my soul, amen? But what does that mean? What does it mean, fear? Does he really mean that we're afraid? I, I thought perfect love drives out fear. You know, 1 John talks about perfect love drives out fear. Well, the word used in 1 John, if you look in the Hebrew Bible, it's this word, pachat, which means terror. It's a different kind of fear. Terror is like when you're going to die and your life is there. And there's, you know, that, that's terror. But this word that we see in Acts 2, the Hebrew Bible defines it as gerat shemayim. Say it with me. Gerat shemayim. Literally means the fear of heaven. They were filled with awe. They were filled with the fear of heaven. I looked up some other places in the Bible where this same word is used. It's Gerat Shemayim. In Acts 5, Ananias and Sapphira, you know that story? They were, they were going to give this offering to the church, and then they decided to keep some back for themselves, and then they went and lied about it to the church. And it says they fell over dead. And it says, fear seized the entire church. Gerat Shemayim came upon the entire church. In Romans 1, 18, it says the wrath of God is being revealed against all of those without Gerat Shemayim, without the fear of heaven. Romans 3, 18, it says there is no fear of God before their eyes. It says they, they don't have Gerat Shemayim. 2 Corinthians 7. You know the passage about godly sorrow and, and worldly sorrow? And he goes through the list and he says, you know, what indignation? And then he says, what alarm? It's the same word. Yerat Shemayim. There, there, there was this fear. When you have godly sorrow, you have this fear of heaven upon your soul. 1 Peter 1, 17 says, since you call on a father who judges each man's work impartially, live your lives as strangers here in reverent Live your lives in Yerat Shemayim. In Hebrews 11, 7, it talks about Noah. And it says, in holy fear, he built the ark. It says, Noah had Yerat Shemayim when he built the ark. And I want to ask you tonight, are you living your life in holy fear? Are you living your life filled with awe? You know, in Acts 2, if you're reading 
that passage and everything seems good, right? I mean, there, all this stuff is going on, all these people becoming Christians. It seems like such a great time. And I'm like, why were they in fear? Why did fear come upon their soul? And so I want to step back for just a minute. And I want to look at what led up to this moment in Acts 2. And we're going to go all the way back to Jesus. Okay? So you guys know this story, but I want you to think about it like you've never heard it before. I want you to think about it like you are experiencing what happened to the early Christians. Amen? Imagine that this is your campus ministry. Because, you know, Jesus, guys, Jesus, the apostles, they were all like late teens, early 20s. It was basically campus ministry. That's what Jesus had. You know, but if you go back, and you go back to the garden, and they're all praying together. You know, imagine you're out on a prayer walk with your campus ministry, and you guys find this wooded area, you stop in this garden, and it's, it's just awesome, you're all praying, and, and then your campus leader gets arrested. Soldiers come in, and they just take them away. Imagine what you'd be feeling if you watched that happen. And then they take him off, and they start torturing him, and beating him. And you start thinking, man, what's going on? I thought he was the Lord. Is that going to happen to me? Then they crucify him. And, and I don't know who all got, I mean, you know, some of the people that got to see him. I, I imagine maybe some of the other guys got to see him as well. They, they saw him on that cross. They saw the nails in his hands. They witnessed him die on a cross. That, that's heavy stuff, man. I don't think many of us have seen one of our best friends be crucified for the faith. They saw him buried. They knew the tomb was there. They, they, they knew where they laid Jesus. They saw him raised again. If you really saw your campus minister get killed, crucified, buried, and then all of a sudden the next day he shows up again, you'd be freaking out, man. You're like, I saw you. And this fear that they had upon their soul. Then Jesus hung out with them for 40 days. You know, just think about the conversations they must have had. 40 days of just hanging out with Jesus and hearing about everything that was going to happen and everything that had happened. And hearing, hey, Jesus, how would you do it? How would you overcome death? What was it like? What did it feel like? What did death feel like? They got to spend that time with Jesus. And then Jesus tells him before he leaves, he says, now you are going to receive power. Now you are going to receive power. The Holy Spirit. That same Spirit that descended on me like a dove. Some of you guys wait a second. It's, it's going to happen to you. And then, he just like ascends into heaven. And think about that. You're standing there with your campus minister and all of a sudden he just starts like floating up. And he's like, where are you going? Like, Renzo! Hey! I mean, he just, he just takes off and disappears into a cloud. You ever see stuff in the clouds, you know, like you see a dog or a camel, you know, for them, probably a camel in the clouds, and, you know, and they're like, hey, there's Jesus, you know, he's in the clouds, and, you know, he's just up there, and the guy's like, no, really, Jesus is in the clouds, not an image, it's him, and then two angels appear to them, dressed in white, you ever had two angels appear to you, dressed in white, that's what these guys were experiencing. Imagine going to Friday night devotional and share good news. Guys, guess what? I saw Jesus in the clouds today. He was flying. The two angels. They're like, okay, bro, you don't get to share anymore. <laughs> That's what these guys experienced. And this is the same Peter that just a few weeks ago had denied Jesus. The same Peter that just a few weeks ago was afraid of a little serving girl. The same Peter that you saw. stands up and he starts to preach. And imagine what you'd be thinking at this moment. He preaches the sermon of his life. And all these people say, brothers, what shall we do? They respond to Peter's sermon. Peter tells them to repent, be baptized for the forgiveness of their sins. And 3,000 people are baptized in a day. Guys, do you understand what that is? Do you understand what that means? 3,000 people were baptized in a day? Imagine if in one day, 
a hundred people were baptized in your campus ministry. Would you be blown away? In a year, if you had a hundred baptisms, you'd be like, man, this is awesome. If 3,000 in a year were baptized, we'd be, we'd be blown away. They had 3,000 people baptized in a day. I want everyone on the front row to stand up. If you're standing on the front row or sitting, stand up, okay? The number of those disciples was about 120, okay? About this many people were in the church, All right? Now, the front row, turn around and look, okay? This is your church in the morning. This is your church at night. Are you kidding me? Of course they were filled with awe. Go ahead and be seated. Why were they filled with awe? Why were they filled with this Yerat Shemayim? Guys, I tell you what, if we witnessed what these guys witnessed in a month and a half, we would be afraid. If we witnessed one of these things, we would be afraid. But I think it's time for a, a wake-up call. Because I think we often, like I said earlier, I think we're often in, in fear, in awe, of the wrong things. What are you afraid of? What are you in awe of? Because I think the first thing we need to do is we need to learn to fear the Lord. Do you fear the Lord? I mean, really. Do you really fear the Lord? Do your actions show it? The things you've done over the past year, could we, could we look at your life and say, wow, there is a person that fears the Lord. They, they get it. They truly fear the Lord. And I'm not just talking about respect. And I'm not just talking about reverence, although we need to respect the Lord and we need to be reverent to the Lord. You know, Proverbs 1, verse 7 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. But fools despise wisdom and discipline. I think sometimes we can be a little too casual with God. You know, we live in a pretty casual society. There's not a lot of respect out there for authority. You know what I mean? And, you, you know, you start calling your teacher by their first name, and maybe you call your parents by their first name, and, you know, we don't hear a lot of yes, sir, and no, sir. We're pretty casual. And there's a good part of that. I think in our relationship with God, we need to have a, a connection and a closeness. There, there's a good part of that. But I think we need to have a fear of the Lord. No, no, God's cool, man. God understands. You know, we, me and God, we got this thing. You know, he's, he, I can sin. I can, I can pretty much do what I want because me and God, we're cool, man. I had a friend tell me one time that, that God was cool with him using drugs. You know, oh yeah, God and I, we have this understanding. I'm like, Really? I would have loved to have heard that conversation when God said, yeah, go ahead and pollute the temple of the Holy Spirit. I, I'm cool with that. But we have this casualness. And you know, when I think about the church in Acts 5, when they watched Ananias and Sapphira die, I don't think that was just respect for God. I think they were afraid. You know, if you, if you walked into church this Sunday and you got the bulletin and you know, the Jerusalem Journal comes out and you're, you're reading it and you're like, Ananias and Sapphira died because they didn't give their offering and they lied, you would be afraid. I'd be checking the exit. I'd be like, all right. <laughs> they had fear of the Lord. And, you know, maybe it's easy to look down on Anna, Ananias and Sapphira and say, man, I, I would never do that. I would never lie. I would never hold back like that. But, you know, I, I wonder, how's your tithe going? You know, how, how are things going in your life? It's easy to look down sometimes on, on situations like this when we have the whole picture, but... But what about your life? Guys, we need to fear the Lord. Now, I want to thank my dad for helping me understand the fear of the Lord. <laughs> my dad's right down here. And, uh, you know, I think our first glimpse sometimes of, of how we learn how to fear the Lord is through our parents. Amen? But uh, my dad was definitely the first glimpse I got of how to fear the Lord. And, and you know, when we weren't good we sometimes got spankings in our house. And it wasn't a, a, a paint stick or a hand or whatever. I mean, it was the belt, all right? And, uh, you know, he didn't beat us. He spanked us. But I'll tell you what, when, when you heard the buckle coming off, you knew it was on. It, it was too late. 
And, and he doesn't bluff. You know, sometimes with my kids, I shouldn't say this because they're here too, but sometimes, you know, we give them warnings and we're like, well, you're going to get it. And, you know, we don't always follow through. He always followed through. <laughs> Even my best friend from childhood, he went on to become a, a Navy search and rescue diver. He's still afraid of my dad. <laughs> my dad never spanked him. But he's like, your dad just gets this look in his eye, you know, and it's like the Hulk or something. And, and you know, you just run. And, and I'm sure he heard my screams from the other room, but he still is afraid of my dad. I learned the fear of the Lord. And don't get me wrong, my dad didn't mistreat me. I'm actually grateful for it. I'm so grateful that my parents disciplined me. And, and I, I, honestly, if your, guy, if, if your guy's parents discipline you and, and spanked you or however they did it, send him a text tonight and just thank them. Thank you for spanking me, because I learned to fear the Lord. You know, one problem I had when I was a kid with that, though, is sometimes you ever get that nervous laughter? Like, you know you're in trouble, but you just start laughing anyway. Oh, you think it's funny? And then it's worse, man. Oh, man, that was bad. But I believe God gives us many opportunities in our lives to understand the fear of the Lord. And, and we've got to be in tune with that. You know, we've got to be in tune with, with times that God is speaking to us. You know, last year in 2013, th there were many times that things were just out of my hands. Multiple occasions that I believe God was teaching me to fear Him. On May 31st, 2013, we were at our church building right up by the airport. And uh, we we'd planned to have campus devotion. We we're going to welcome in all the incoming freshmen and we planned to have it at this park, at this lake, and there was a, a threat of severe weather. So we said, well, let's just be safe. Let's move it to the church building. Proved to be a good decision. Um, you know, later on, the, the weather started getting bad, and tornado watches were issued. And the sirens started going off. So we, we got everyone inside. I, I went outside and just kind of checking the situation, looking around. Hey, does it look too bad? And, and uh, one of our interns, Chanel Chabuski, she's up in New York now. Um, I see her walking outside, and she's getting on her scooter. And I'm like, Chanel, what are you doing? The sirens are going off. She's like, i got to get home. I'm like, you're not going anywhere. Because one, if you go, you're going to die. And if you die, your mom's going to kill me. You get inside. So she goes in, and, and, and we, we all kind of go into the back corner there in the basement. And the sirens are going off, and these warnings and everything. And all of a sudden, you felt the pressure drop. Like, literally, you, you feel your ears, and, and all of a sudden, the air pressure is gone. And everybody got down. We were praying. I mean, one of the sisters, getting emotional just thinking about it, one of the sisters uh, was from a different state where they don't have tornadoes. She, she's just weeping, and, and we're praying. We're singing blue skies and rainbows, and, and uh, <laughs> we were. And, uh, and, you know, a few minutes later, everything calmed down. And the roof was still on, and I went outside, and, and there was some minor damage around the church building, some big limbs down, stuff like that. And then my wife, in the meantime, had been trying to get a hold of her mom, who was at, at our house with our kids. And uh, she finally got a hold of her, and uh, she said they were there, they were okay, but she goes, I, I, I don't know what happened to the house. She goes, I, I don't know how bad it is, but everybody on the street is stopping to look at our house. I'm like, that's not good. So we, we kind of checked on everybody, made sure everything was okay at the church, and jump in the car, and we're racing home. And as we got about a mile from our house, it just got scary. I mean, there were, there were like these white picket fences that normally line this one road by our house. All the fences just blown apart. Fence posts, everything just gone. There's cars blown off in the ditch. There's trees, you know, this big around, just pulled out of the ground by their roots. Trees this big around just snapped in half like a toothpick. It was frightening. And, and as we're driving to our house, we have no idea what to expect. The only, the only security we had at that moment is knowing that our kids were okay and that God was in control. All the power was out, made it even more frightening. We pulled onto our street. I could barely see our house. Limbs, debris all over the place. And I've got a, a few images. Normally, you can just see right through there. And if you see that black thing that's there, that, that's our basketball goal. It literally lifted it over backwards and slammed it on the ground. Trees all over our house. Holes in the roof. This is the other angle from our front yard. You see that tree there in the foreground? I mean, that thing's probably about that big around. And that was taken from our backyard, thrown into our front yard. Uh, the column on our front porch, I mean, it was like six inches from just falling off completely. Uh, this is our neighbor's trampoline. It blew over our fence, over our kid's playhouse, and wrapped the steel posts wrapped around that tree. But guys, it, it was frightening. 
We weren't in control. Later, it was confirmed that an F3 tornado had come through for 17 miles it was on the ground. Winds of 158 to 206 miles per hour. And you know what, guys? That night, I was grateful for God's providence. God protected us, and I feared the Lord. I had to climb onto a roof in a lightning storm that night to put tarps on to mitigate the water damage. And I tell you, when I'm on the roof with lightning going on, I feared the Lord. He was in control, not me. A few months later, I went to uh, the doctor, the dermatologist. I had some moles, you know, a couple different moles, you know, white people problems, you know. And, and uh, <laughs> went to the dermatologist, and uh, she saw this spot on my leg, and she's like, you know, that, that doesn't look real good, so we're going to do a biopsy on that. So I'm like, okay, no big deal, you know, I'm young, you know, what, what's the problem? And, and so they did a biopsy, and a week later, she calls me up, and she says, well, you, you have melanoma. And I said, okay, well, what's melanoma? She goes, you have cancer. Wow. Three words you don't want to hear your doctor say. You have cancer. Now, skin cancer, but melanoma is the, the most dangerous type of skin cancer. Had to have surgery, have it cut off. I was going to put a picture up, but I know some of you guys just ate. So if you, know, you want to see it, I'll show you later. But, but they, they cut it out, and they got all the cancer out. But you know, for a few weeks until I knew it was all gone, it was like I had no control. If that thing spreads, if they don't get it all and it metastasizes and it gets into my bones or something like that, I'm done, man. God is in control, guys. You think you're in control? We're never really in control. Only God is in control. You think you got it? You ain't got nothing. God's got it. Now, the good thing is God loves you. God wants to protect you. God wants to raise you up. But guys, we got to fear the Lord. Amen? We need to fear the Lord. You know, the last thing I want to talk about tonight won't happen unless you fear the Lord. Because once we get things into perspective, once we realize that we're not in control, but that God's in control, once we have fear of the Lord, then we're going to do this. We're going to fear no man. Do you fear man? You get afraid of what people think about you for being a Christian? You afraid to share your faith? Afraid to speak the truth and love, maybe even to other Christians sometimes? Afraid to have those tough conversations with your brother or your sister or your friends that you're studying the Bible with? Romans 8:31 says if God is for us, who can be against us? You know what I see in Peter when he preached in Acts 2? Peter stopped fearing man. Peter that, that bowed down and cowered to this little servant girl, he finally got it, man. When he saw Jesus raised from the dead, he saw the Spirit come down on them, he heard the languages being spoken, he heard that violent wind, and he said, I don't fear man anymore. I fear the Lord. Peter stopped fearing man. But who are you afraid of? Do you realize that man can do nothing to you that God does not either allow or ordain? Do you know that? Man can do nothing to you unless God lets him do it. He can't. But why do we fear man? I believe we fear man when we stop fearing God. When, once things get out of perspective, once we lose that fear and that focus on God, then we start fearing man. If you really understand who God is, what he says, and what he promises, why would you fear anyone? Because God's in control, guys. You know, a while back, we started getting some persecution on one of our campuses. And two different campus ministers from two different groups on campus started going around and trying to pull students out of our group, telling them all kinds of slanderous things about our group and just making stuff up and, and, and just telling them, hey, you don't want to be a part of that group. I've heard things about them. You know, our group on campus, we're, we're, that just didn't sit well with me. Because on campus, we, we serve. I mean, we're one of the most active groups on campus. 
we do things just to help the community and we're involved. We're one of the most uh, participatory groups on the whole campus. And so when I heard this, it just bothered me that they were trying to hurt our students. And so I decided I was going to have a chat with these campus ministers. I went up to campus and I started looking around for them. And guess what? I found one of them. <laughs> and I went up to him and, and we'd met a few times and I asked him, I said, hey, can, can we talk for a minute? And he looked a little nervous. I said, I, I just want to talk to you, man. And I, I was very respectful, but I was also very direct. I said, you know, a lot of our students have been saying that you, you've been telling them bad things about our group and and, you know, you're going and telling them they shouldn't be part of our group and that, you know, they, they, they need to have nothing to do with us and, and, and kind of all these rumors and stuff like that. And, and, and I said, you know, I, I don't know what, did, did we do something to offend you? Did we do something to hurt you? And he said, well, you know, I, I read, read some stuff on the Internet, you know, and, and I, I said, about us, about our group here on this campus? And he goes, no, it was a, some other city. And I'm like, really? I'm like, recently? And he's like, oh, it was from like 10 years ago. And I said, oh, okay, so... You heard something from someone that you don't know on the internet that happened 10 years ago in another city, and you blaming it on us? I said, man, you can't believe everything you read on the internet. But then, you know, I mean, he's a campus minister, right? So I said, well, you're a Christian, right? It's like, well, yeah, yeah, I'm a Christian. I said, well, you know, in Matthew 18, the Bible says, hey, if your brother sins against you, go and show him his fault. It doesn't say go and, and slander them. Or go and gossip about them. I said, man, come on, if, if we do something wrong, if, if our group is doing something wrong, our students are offending people or, or doing something that's sinful, come tell me and we'll repent. Come tell me, we'll change it because we, we want to follow the Bible. We're living out the Bible. But you got to live it out too, man. We got to follow Matthew 18 here. I said, you know, if, if you see something going on, come and let me know. And we'll deal with it. You know, we'll, we'll take care of it. But otherwise, I'm going to expect that you're not going to talk about our group anymore. We didn't hear much more from him after that. But I had to not be afraid of man. And, and let me just say this. I'm not saying I don't fear. But I'm saying we got to overcome it. Amen? We can't bow down to fear. We can't bow down to man. We may have those fears. But because we fear the Lord, we overcome those. You know, then I went... And I decided I got to get in touch with this other campus minister. That one went pretty good, so let me find the other one now. And, uh, you know, so it was a, a female campus minister. And I prayed before I met with her. I said, God, let me study the Bible with her. I, 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 that one went so good, I, I want to go farther. Let's study the Bible. And so we met on campus, and, and you know, I, I told her kind of the same thing. I had this concern that they were talking about our group and saying some things. And, and uh, you know, what, what happened next was amazing. She, she started tearing up. And she's like, I'm really sorry. She's like, well, I shouldn't have done that. Like, I should have came to you. I, I should have met with you. We've met before. I know you. I, I should have came to you and talked to you. And, and what I did was wrong. And then she's like, but, but I do have some questions for you because, you know, you guys believe some things different than we do about baptism. And, and she's like, I, I'm, I'm kind of embarrassed to say this, but I'm a campus minister and I don't know anything about baptism. She's like, could you teach me about baptism? And I said, well, yeah, how would you like to do a Bible study right now? <laughs> and so we did about a two to three hour Bible study that day right in the cafeteria on campus about baptism. Guys, we got to stop fearing man. We're in a spiritual war. There's going to be battles and you can't be afraid. You can't run from the fight. You got to run to the fight. There, it's not maybe there will be battles. There will be battles. You will face opposition. You will face persecution. You will face man. But are you going to be afraid of him? Are you? That's not rhetorical. Are you? Guys, I have a challenge for us. For the rest of this conference, for the rest of our lives, let us live our lives in Yerat Shemayim. Let us live in a fear of heaven. That when you see things happening around you, when you see a sunset, when you see the ocean, when you're on, you, when you see anything that God has done, that you have this fear of heaven.
a fear of the Lord. I pray that this weekend, as we see what God is doing in our campus ministries around the country, around the world, that we have a fear of the Lord. That we don't think and, and hear about Acts 2 in the church in the early, in, in, you know, in the first century, but we live it out. That we have that same fear. That we, number one, fear the Lord, and number two, we fear no man. Brothers and sisters, let us be filled with awe, and to God be the glory. Amen? Thanks, bro. Amen. Thank you, Tim. What a way to start off the conference.